Hello, good day and welcome back. So today we're going to be looking at section four of application packaging and structuring, but we're going to bundle Java, Groovy, and Scala together. And the reason why we're going to do this is because these are the three languages that run on the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine. So even though they're different languages, um, remember they're using the same Java Virtual Machine. And so at the end result, when you write source code, whether it's Java file, Groovy file, or Scala file, it gets compiled to that class file, which is that byte class, that platform independent code, which means that oh, it's platform agnostic. It um, is written to run on a virtual machine, not a real machine like a x86 or Atom processor or anything like that. And so that's why we're going to look at them together because even the packaging and everything that they always support you structure your application is the same. And all you do is substitute one file for another. All right, source file that is. But in terms of package and class file, it's all remain the same. It's class path, all this other stuff we're going to talk about in a minute remains the same. So we're going to assume that oh, we have the same application and of course we're going to break it up into different components or pieces and in Java world and again when I say Java I'm talking about JVM languages which is Groovy and Scala so Java world you break this up into packages and sub packages so same idea um, pretty much across the, all the languages that you can break things up into even smaller smaller pieces so that you, it's good for abstraction or reuse or whatever right um, so you don't go crazy trying to break, build a big application. You can have a number of people working on it. Um, the only difference is sort of like what sort of support the language give you to help you with those abstractions. As you see, going back in C and C++, as I see, not a whole lot other than a file. You compile it and you can create an object file. And, you know, the other languages, they kind of do a little bit more. All right. So specifically for Java, what you have is your Java source file. And even while you're writing your source file, you put them in packages. So in Java, everything ends up in a package, whether you want to or not. If you don't specify a package, it goes into the default package. Other than that, it's always in a package. So it's sort of like Go in that sense that you always must have a package. Um, and then the other thing that Java does is um, you put packages in a directory to reflect the package name. And we'll sort of see that a little bit more. It's, it's kind of weird, but we'll, we'll get a sense of that. Um, when you go to Groovy, um, when you write, have a Groovy project, because Groovy is built on Java, guess what? You can have a Groovy application. Remember, once it's running, it's just class files. But those class files could have come from Java, because Java compiles them to class files, or they could have been Groovy files. But once the JVM sees it, it just sees that class file. It doesn't know or care where it came from, whether those that class file was generated from Groovy or was generated from Java. And so that's why when you have a Groovy project, you can either have Groovy file or Java files, and then they compile, get packaged the same way, and um, you can reuse them, of course. Same thing with Scala. Exact same story. With Scala, you can have a Scala module, and it can compose of Java file and Scala files. Get compiled on to class files, which are your platform independent thing because it's targeting a virtual machine. Now, a little bit more on the whole packaging of things in um, Java world. So you have source files. We know they can be Java file, Groovy file, or Scala files. And you could have them in directories that represent different packages. Um, so here I have package A and package B. And what happened is that's on the source file. But when you go to binary and you compile them, each of those that source file give you a corresponding that class file. And then that's a class file within that package. But now you can create a, what's called a jar file, which is similar to that archive file that we have in C and C plus. We can create like a .a file, archive file, or even a .so file with a shareable object. Um, here you create a jar file including all these class files but remember the class files are platform independent anyway so it's, it's just an archive and you can use simple tools like G G zip to look at that archive and see the files in there and they're actually just in a directory structures that mirror thing so here's an example when you um go to run your application or even compile things in java um either using the java compiler or java um uh to to, to run the application um you have to specify a class path. Now, maybe a class, it default, enforce a class path, the default class path, but then you can specify a class path where you can find additional things. And the additional things we're talking about here is we'll find additional that class file. Because remember, at runtime, all the JVM cares about is that class file, this binary intermediate file. That's all it cares about. So when you are dealing with a class path that just says, okay, my class path contains path one, two, and three, and if they happen to be directories we're talking about, well then, let's say those direct, the directory structure ha is like this and have these that classes in there. When you go to import, this all you would import those different types of classes that you need. So on the one side, we have the classes, the compile thing where they are in on your file system. And on the other side, the right hand side, we have all you import that encode that you want to reuse. 
And just in case it's not sufficiently confusing um, using uh, directories as your class path, you can use, specifying on your class path, those jar files. But remember, those jar files are just an archive. So you can imagine that the Java compiler or Java runtime is going to just expand it into some directory and now have the similar directory structure. So if you say that, oh, my class path um, contains, you know, UI.jar, and of course UI.jar has in it the um, UI slash UI type that class in it, mirroring the same directory structure you had, well, guess what? You can import it the same way. So it doesn't matter how many that jar files you have, just so long as in within that jar file, um, it has the right structure for where to find things. Now, we're not trying to learn Java here, so we're not going to spend too much time on what the package directory should be named and good naming convention and all this other stuff. We just kind of want to get a basic idea because you're going to see later on when we write some code and try to compile it, it'd be good if you kind of understand that oh, there's a class path that come into play when the jar file is being used or when the actual file system path is being used, why the location of how you import things and where you say to find things are done. Because if you specify a class path and it's a directory, and then you go to import something, it's relative to that directory. If you specify a jar in your class path, well then, when that jar expands, well, you gotta kind of imagine it all, it's gonna be expanded in that directory. Not really, but sort of imagine it that way. So let's jump into some coding. And so let's just start with C++ and just see how we adapt things. Now I have to do some cleaning up. Um, of course, I want to remove um, the .h files and I'm going to rename all this, that .cpp files to, to .java files, um, not that .go. And uh, I need to remove that the object files and so on. So regardless of how I clean up, you can go through and just delete it by hand. Um, you don't have to do it the same way I'm doing it. I'm going to leave the, leave the one make file. Um, in our project directory, I'm going to get rid of the, the individual one that I had in, within each package directory. Um, generally, people who work on Java do not use make files to compile their Java application. They use either, either ant from back in the day or they use today Maven um, and Gradle are the two popular ones with Gradle coming down very strong um, recently years. But for a long time, Maven was the thing and Maven sort of replaced ant. All right, so we're going to start here by modifying our main.java, and we have to do a number of things. Remember, in Java, everything must be in a class. Everything is in a class. So it's not like Go, where we can have a package expose a function or export a function. Everything must be in a class. So the other thing is, so for call or factory meta here, that has to come from a class. So we're going to have um, a class called text prompter, for example. If we just can't say, like, import text and then text that factory. That doesn't exist. Everything is inside of a class. And of course, from based on what the previous slides I showed you, if I want to import a type, I must say what type it is. So in this case, on line three, I'm saying import UI that UI prompter. Uh, that's a type. In this case, it happens to be an interface. And then the fourth line is import that UI that text that text prompter. And that happens to be a class. And so I showed you already how that sort of matches up with the path that um, those that class file should be in whether it's on a file system, if it's your class path, it's specifying a file system, or if it's inside of a jar file, that jar file must have these things inside that same sort of structure. Um, the next thing I want to do is go work on other that Java. Again, I have to put this in a package. I'm going to put it in the same package as my main that Java, because I have them in the same directory. I'm going to say they're in the same package. And because I'm putting it in a package, Java requires that the package name carry the same name as the directory. And so here, I'm going to use common also as a package name. And of course, this is going to be a method we want to call without instantiating an object. So I must make it a public and static method. The other thing is Java requires that whatever the public thing that is being exported from the package is, the class name, the file name must have that name. So in this case, I'm doing public class other. The file name got to be other that Java matching case matching the name of the class which means my main.java also have to be changed. Um, so now I'm going to jump down to my UI package. And so the directory is already called UI. And one of the things I'm going to do here is I'm just going to make an interface. So I'm going to say I have this interface called UI prompter, which, um, you know, by contract has this method called read, which accepts some bytes, an uh, array of bytes, and return an int. Of course, we name the, the file name from UI that Java to UI prompter. And then now the same thing, I'm going to say, I have a text prompter. So this is one of the UI interfaces we have, right? It's a text interface, and maybe I call it text prompter. But no, I'm exposing a class. Why? Because um, the interface just defined the contract of the operations I could perform. But now this text prompter is the class that's going to provide my factory method that I want to create um, more text prompter from. This is going to be a public static um, 
method, factory method, and it's going to return a UI prompter. Now, what is a UI prompter? Well, it's a um, text prompter. I noticed, and I don't know if you're going to run into this though, but my editor was telling me that all my package for my text prompter here, UI.text, is invalid. And I couldn't figure out why it was doing that. So once I quit it and come back in, it seems to work just fine. Okay, so let's now try and compile our UI prompter. And you could say I could just say Java C for Java compiler, and I could compile UI slash UI prompter. And it compiles it and it gives me the corresponding that class file right next to the Java file. Now let's try and compile our UI text and text prompter. And you see it though it fails, it says I don't know what UI prompter is. And even though text is in sort of a sub package of UI, I still have to go and say import UI that UI prompter, that type. I have to get that type. And so no, it's still um, complaining. It said that it cannot be converted to a UI prompter. That's because I'm saying I'm returning a UI prompter, but I'm actually returning, I'm trying to return a new text prompter. So in that case, what I have to do is say implement. So I have to make this um, connection between the text prompter and the interface it's implementing by saying it's implemented. Now I can compile text prompter, and so I get a class there. Now I'm going to go back and work on my main at Java, and I try to compile that, and that fails. Um, because um, it doesn't know this factory method. So I need to go back and rename that. And so I, I fix that. And now um, let's try and compile again. And now it fails. It says, hey, where's this get user method coming from? Well, we said before that order have to come from a class. So try to get it from my other class. And now when I try to compile other class, it also fails. And the reason this is failing now is because in other that class, I have to import because it does not know what UI prompter is. I have to import UI prompter. And so this so far doesn't look very different from what we were doing in Go, uh, but I have to import it. And so now it knows what it is. And so now I could go back and I can say compile main. And notice it actually compile object other that class for me, other that Java, and give me the class file, then it compile main. So that's really nice and clever that it would do that. As a matter of fact, if I just remove all the classes we've used so far, and I say compile main.java, it actually find and compile all the other ones in the other um, directories. So, so that's pretty cool. But like I said, um, there's a lot of work to do. So, but we don't want to do it. We want to pretend that we took all our classes that we already compiled, put them in a jar, because that's what you do, is you'd be using jars mostly. You don't really access classes directly. You package them in jar, you get them packaged as jar, and that's sort of like what we say, a Java library. What we're talking about is this jar file that contains multiple that class files. So that's how Java ships things, is as a library, um, or oh, you, you reusable code. And notice inside my jar file, I'm confirming that though these classes are in a directory structure within the pack in the jar file or in this library in a way that is consistent with the directory that and how I'll need to import them. So when I say import UI that UT UI prompter that class, well inside the jar file it needs to be UI forward slash because that's like a path. Okay. All right. Um, so now I can remove the class files because I don't need them anymore, right? I have them inside of this archive. And once they the archive, now I can just reference um, say compile main and specify um, thing. But notice if I don't specify that I'm using this library, what happened? It go and it recreate all those that class files for me, just like I was saying before. It takes care of that and that's nice. But in this case, I want to specifically say, I want my class file to be this jar. And so now it needs to get whatever class it's looking for from the, the jar file. But our other that class is not inside of my jar file, right? So and my class path only said to use this jar. So where's the other that class coming from? It doesn't know. I mean, yes, it's in that directory, but remember my class path that I've often written now specifically say to use UI the jar. So I have to now um, add my current directory if I want to the other um, to my class path. So what I do is I first compile all that Java to get at that class, and then I add a dot to say this is my current. This also is my cl uh, class path. So now I specify two things as my class path: my current directory and UI forward slash UI dot jar. And notice how my main that Java was able to compile now. And it did not recreate my UI prompter that class nor my text prompter that class because I could get those from the jar file. And it knew where to find um, other that class because I say use my current directory as a class path and use from there um, look for things. Okay. And so it was able to find that. And since it knew it was in the common package, well, it found it in the current directory. All right, so let's modify this make file. So I haven't run my application. I think it's going to work because you know everything compiled so far. Usually, when you compile a run thing with Java, it might compile. When you go to run it at runtime, it might say, oh, I can't find a class. But since we have all the classes here, I expect it to run, so I'm not going to run it. What I'm going to do is speed up um, how I'm going to modify or make file here to do all the things that we're doing by com on command line, which is 
we're going to compile all the UI classes and we're going to stick them in a jar. Now remember, um, we're using this make file from C, C++, and we have this um, rule that can infer things. So this is on line eight. We see we can say, well, if I, have, I wanted that class, where, how do I get it from a Java? Well, I use this compile command Java C, specify the thing that I give it, which is the, that Java file, and it's going to give me a that class file. And then um, for our application, we can say it all, um, again, remember we had to add that to our, we're using our current directories also in our class path, right? So for our application, we're going to say we have these app classes, and I'm also going to put them in a jar. And so now we're going to end up with two jars. We have one jar with our UI stuff, which you could think of our reusable code, and then we have another jar with the application itself. So if you wanted to ship to user your full application, you have to ship them both. You have to ship them the application, the jar, app, the jar, and the UI, the next library that it depends on, which is UI.jar. But if you just want to ship somebody the UI, that jar library, so that they can reuse it in their own application, well, then you just ship them that alone. So we've broken up our application, make it totally reusable. And so using the run target in our make file, notice how it runs our application now. And if the application doesn't exist, it compiles it and run it. And why? It's because run depend, the run target depends on the application. And then the application have the dependency on its app classes plus the UI library. And so if any one of those things are missing, make to take care of compiling them. And we're not going to spend time talking about make because I'll make the for, and for dependencies and stuff because this is not what this is about. All I want to show you is that Java provides a mechanism for you to break up your application in pieces, turn those source codes into classes, take those classes, pack them into jar, which are called Java libraries, and how you might use the library. And we have demonstrated that we can do it here. You might not agree whether this is better or worse or the same as Go or C or C++. That's your preference, but this is one way in which it's done, and this is pretty much the way it's done. The details about if you would actually put one package within another or not, this other thing, is you can debate that on your team, but this is a general idea. All right. Uh, thanks for spending time with me looking at this. Um, I didn't worry to sp split out, like I said, Groovy and Java and Scala because just substitutes <laughs> Groovy and Scala and you get the exact same thing. Just literally write a Scala class, put it there, and it'll compile and to the class classes and then just add it to the jar. Same thing. Same thing with Groovy. All right. Take care. Um, follow me on Twitter at Stroversity1. Follow me on Instagram, Stroversity. Um, see you in the next video. Um, hopefully by next week my life should be back to normal and I should be able to put out like, you know, the videos pretty much between two days apart or so. So two, three videos a week. So, um, next week I should be able to do two. Um, like Tuesday and Thursday should get video next week. Um, this week had been pretty hectic. All right. Thanks for your time and have a wonderful day. Thumbs up the video and constructive comments, please. Um, see you. Have a good one.